I'm going to invite you to turn to Psalm 23 with me and then also uh, the Gospel of John, John chapter 10. So I'm going to need you to go to two places if you would. The Gospel of John 10, we're actually going to go there first and then we're going to go to Psalm 23, all right? So in your Bibles there with me, John chapter 10 and then Psalm uh, 23. We have been studying through the Psalms for quite a bit, and um, we are talking about life with a good shepherd, and uh, boy, you sure do find that in Psalm 23, the life with a good shepherd. He's a good shepherd, and I'm very thankful for that, and I hope that you are encouraged by your Savior, and I hope that you are refreshed when you... Uh, go to the Bible and when you partake of your devotion or when you spend time with Jesus in prayer, I hope that you are reminded how good he is to you. And uh, I don't know how good he's been to you, uh, but personally, I know how good he's been to me. And uh, and so uh, Jesus and I have a little shouting party. You know what I mean? Ever had one of those? And uh, that's good for us to do and just be thankful for all that God's done. But I do know this, I, I don't know all that he's done in your life, but if he has saved you, uh, that's worth shouting over, amen? Uh, that's worth praising him for and just thanking the Lord for your salvation. And I rejoice in that and I am thankful for all that God has done. But look at John chapter 10 with me. I want you to look at verse 10. Actually, just go to verse 11. Let's just jump there. John chapter 10, verse 11, notice this. I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd, he gives his life for the sheep. But I don't really believe that maybe you can really understand the context of that until you appreciate the previous passages or scriptures before it. Would you go to verse 7, and let's kind of read through a few of these. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, truly, truly. That's what that means. Verily, verily, uh, truly, truly, true, true. I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. And that ever, all that ever come before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Notice this. So why is this so important? It's a reflection of Psalm 23. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and destroy, I am come. That they, the sheep, everyone might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But in contrast, that is a hireling, someone who's hired to take care of the sheep, and is not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not, seeth the wolf cometh, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. That person takes off. They don't hang around to protect the sheep. And the wolf catches them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling, well, they flee, they take off, because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. Verse 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Let's say all of verse 14 together. Ready, begin. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Would you look up here? Jesus says... I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep. I know who belongs to me. And here's what I love about that statement that he ends it with. They know me too. They know how good I am. Do you know how good Jesus is? See, life with the good shepherd, may I submit to you tonight this statement? Because we've been going through Psalm 23. The life with the good shepherd, I want to remind you that he is for you. Jesus is for you. I am thankful that Jesus is for me. Sometimes you have no idea where people stand. Sometimes people will tell you they're for you, and they are not. Sometimes people will tell you they'll do something, and they don't follow through. Sometimes people will make a commitment that they never intended on 
keeping. Sometimes there are things that people say that they do not mean, but Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and on top of that, they know that what I'm saying is true because they know me as their shepherd. I have a proven track record with them. Boy, I like that. If you go to Psalm 23, I'd like for you to look at, as a cross-reference and obviously correspondence to this, Verse 3. Let's just begin in verse 1. How about that? We'll get a little running start. Uh, you know this psalm, Psalm 23. The Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David is the writer here. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. See, Psalm 23 is all about the sheep in the good shepherd's care. As a sheep, David is boasting because David is not the shepherd here, although David was a shepherd boy. Do you remember that story? David was a little shepherd boy. Man, he was attending to the flocks. And boy, his dad and the boys were having a, a meeting because the king was about to be picked and and of course, uh, the prophet had come and, and said, you know, we're looking for a king. And I was told to come here. And boy, uh, uh, David's father, boy, he lined him up, did he not? Well, here's, here's the voice. Here's the pick. Uh, nope, 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 nope. Is there one more? Oh, yeah. That's just David. He's tending the sheep so we can have our meeting. Well, I need to meet that guy. And, of course, we know the story from there that the people had picked their own king. They wanted Saul, who was a head and shoulders taller than everyone. They cared more about the hour than the statue of a man. But we know David, he was a little fellow. But God looked on the inward, did he not? And, David, and God said, I want David as my king. And so we know the story that David went from a shepherd to a king. But here David is not the shepherd, he is writing about the shepherd. And he is boasting of how wonderful it is to belong to the good shepherd. And he is letting us know how good the shepherd is. And that's what Jesus said in John 10 that we just read. I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. May I brag on Jesus with you just a little bit and let you know. There is nothing like being in the care of my good shepherd. Now, I don't know if you've ever, have you ever had a boo-boo? You ever had a boo-boo when you were a kid? Boo-boos. Got a little boo-boo, a little cut. Yesterday, my daughter took a spill on, the, on our bikes. We were cleaning out the garage. Don't you love those days where you clean out the garage? Lord, have mercy. Man, I tell you what, what a nightmare, but uh, it was good for us to do, and and uh, so we got, uh, we were advantageous in our venture, and, and boy, every time we'd bring something out, everybody, they saw something they haven't seen in six months or hadn't touched, and everybody wanted to touch it or play with it or move it around, and, and we're just trying to clean up. We don't want you to play with it and clean, we're trying to straighten up. Well, the bikes come out, and the tires got pumped once again, they got wiped off, and the seats got adjusted from the last time that we rode them, and because uh, our kids had gotten a little bit bigger and, and are taller. And so instead of being flat-footed, they, we wanted them to be on their toes. And so we raised the seats up. And boy, they took off. And they were riding. And here comes one of the kids. Mom, Dad, Abigail has bit the dust. She has turned the corner sharp. And she banged herself up a little bit. But may I say to you, she did not want the care of Daddy. She wanted the care of, guess who? Mommy. And may I say to you, there's nothing like the good care of good old mom. But in a spiritual sense, I'm in the best care under my good shepherd. He's good to me. And I want to brag on him letting you know that he gave his life for me on that cross so that I could be a part of his family. Didn't we sing that tonight? I'm so glad I'm a part 
of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by my good works. That's not what that song says, is it? Because it wouldn't line up Scripture. We are cleansed by His blood. He went to, crawl, to the cross for you and I. Jesus Christ, that good shepherd, He took your penalty, He took your sin and my sin, and He nailed it to the cross. He sure is good. Well, that's the kind of shepherd that I need in control of my life. See, the good shepherd knows what I need. Sometimes I think I know what I need. Sometimes I think I know what it's, what's best. Sometimes I think I, I, I have the right decision. Sometimes I think that I am in control, and when I try to be in control, I just usually end up messing things up. But I am at my best when Christ is in control of me. See, a shepherd who would lay down his life for me so that I could have his life should be in control. But do you realize that he's not always in control? Because I am the one who controls Christ being in control. Yet he wants to be in control, but yet he allows my will, my choice, my free will, my volition. He allows you and I to choose whether he will be Lord of our life. I want to submit to you, as I did last time, why in the world would you and I, as a sheep, want to uh, graze on barren and burned up pastures that the world and Satan offers us when we could be in the care of the good shepherd? He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. There's no doubt that where God is leading is for your best and for my best. And he does that through Jesus. In this psalm, David is boasting for sure of the benefits. And in verse 3, once again it says, He restoreth my soul, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I'd like to give you a few reasons why it's important for you and I to be under Christ's control Yes, He is for you, but I want you to know it's good for you and I to be under His control. Number one, as I mentioned very briefly last time, because the Good Shepherd is always there to pick you up when you fall. And by the way, you do fall. Every Christian has, every Christian will. I wish that when I got saved, I wouldn't have any more problems. Amen? That would have been a blessing right there. I wish God would have tagged that on there, but he didn't. I don't know why he didn't, but I have quite a few opinions on it. And I will share one that's very practical with you. And I believe that to be one thing for my flesh that I would not appreciate and value what he has done for me if I felt like I arrived on my own. And if I felt like I didn't need him every hour, Lord, I need thee every hour. And to be honest with you, I don't think an hour is good enough. I think that's too long on our own. I think I can mess a whole lot, in a, a lot up in an hour. I can set some records in an hour. I think it's good that I need him every moment. The good shepherd is there to pick you up when you fall. I wasn't there to pick my daughter up. The accident had already happened. But mom sure did make it out there in record time. See, the circumstances of life can knock you down, can they not? Life just has a way of upsetting the apple cart. Job said that a man that is born of woman is, is born a few days and full of trouble. My son has a way of getting in trouble like nobody's business. He is a chip off the old block. He can get in trouble faster than you can say no. He's already done it. And when I look at him and he gets in trouble, I tell him, you act just like your mother. No, I know this. The Bible says, 
a man or woman that is born of woman, by the way, we all have been born of a woman. Guess what we are? We are troublemakers. We get in trouble. We can mess stuff up. Life has a way of doing that for us. But did you know that sheep can be cast down? And by the way, when sheep get cast down, it's a very pathetic sight. I'd like to illustrate it for you tonight by getting on the floor and uh, putting my feet and my hands up in the air. But I've got to be cautious with you. I think that would hurt more than it would help illustrate the point. But when sheep get comfortable, they usually find a little kind of rivet out area. Uh, have you ever seen a dog dig in the ground? And what they do is they, they scurry up the ground or they, they find a spot that's just a little bit cooler. And so sheep will find that spot that maybe has been hollowed out just a little bit. And they'll get in that nook and they'll start to stretch out. And they'll put one leg out and they'll put another leg out. And before you know it, they kind of go whoop. And then you, well, this is five, but they do four. They got, they got four legs pointing up in the air. And what happens is, it's a very pitiful sight. They're lying on their back with their feet in the air, and they will cry and bleep. They will cry and they will frantically struggle just to stand up, by the way, without any success. Sometimes it will cry out for help for, for hours, but generally it lies there in frustration, unable to help itself. And if the sheep isn't quickly regained to its feet, if it's not moved to its feet in a short amount of time, that sheep will die in that condition. It's cast down. If the shepherd does not arrive within a reasonable amount of time to help that sheep out, that sheep will stay in that position. And once in that position, it cannot right itself. If it's left in that position, it will ultimately lose its life. And that is why the shepherd keeps track of every one of his sheep. That's why we have the story in the Bible that uh, Jesus said, Would you not leave the 99 to find the one, it's important that you know where they are and that you are there to help. I want you to know that I know where you are and I'm always available for you and I'm always there to help you. Why? Because life can cast you down. One minute you're up, one minute you're pedaling, the next minute you're on the side of the road wondering what happened. I don't know what happened. All I know is now that I'm hurt. You know what you do? You're not really looking for answers and you're not trying to really uh, solve the problem of how it happened. You know what you're wanting? You're wanting, hey, just help me up. Just pick me up. Bandage the wounds. Stop the bleeding. Wipe the tears, if you will. I just need your help. And that's why the shepherd keeps track of his sheep. And if one goes missing... Off he goes to restore that sheep. Did you notice that in verse 3? He restoreth my soul. He puts back in its original position. He restores my soul. As you contemplate that sheep in your mind on its back, with its four legs up, crying. Trying to get back to its feet. I wonder if that sometimes describes you spiritually in your life. Over and over and over and over and over. I, I don't know if a week goes by. That somebody doesn't tell me when I begin to probe or ask the questions, well, why aren't they in church? What happened to them? How come they used to come and, and now they don't anymore? Or, or, or what led them to being so faithful to now just never attending? And you will hear the story, well, they got hurt. And I think about getting hurt, and then in my mind, they got cast down. And then my mind goes back to the thought, well, 
man, everyone gets cast down, but did they realize and did they call on and did they, whether someone came physically to their aid and, and sometimes that's overlooked, but did they realize that they had the care of the good shepherd? Did they realize that even in their state, no matter what their circumstances was, that Jesus was there for them? That maybe the church bailed on them, and maybe the pastor hurt them, and maybe the deacons hurt them, and maybe a member of the church hurt them and didn't say all the nice words or, or didn't meet their expectations. But what does that have to do with the good shepherd? What about him? What about him? As you look into the Bible... You find that some of the greatest people in the Bible, some of the greatest saints in God's Word, they knew what it was to be cast down. And I mentioned several of them. I think of David, Moses, and even Samuel, who really the Bible had nothing bad to say about Samuel, but his two sons, his sons were wicked. And it broke his heart. But I'd like for you to... Look at with me 2 Corinthians, and I'd like to take you to another character and illustrate this to you in the Bible of the Apostle Paul and what he had to say. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 about being cast down. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verses 8 and 9 with me if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 8 and 9. Boy, look at this. Uh, Paul says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Man, you ever been stressed out? You ever had a little stress issues? We are perplexed. Man, I can't even figure it out. I can't even wrap my mind around the thing. But I'm not in despair. I'm not going to lose hope. Persecuted. Man, someone ever said anything about you that's not right? Even if they were right, should they have said it? Paul said, I've been persecuted. But I wasn't forgotten about. Jesus didn't forget me. And look at the next two words in verse 9. Cast, say it with me, down. Cast down. But not destroyed. A sheep left to itself with its four legs up and no shepherd did care for it. Guess what will happen to it? It will die on its own. Paul said, I've been perplexed, we're distressed, but I've been cast down. But I won't be destroyed. Verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. People will ask, why did such tragedy happen to me? Why do bad things happen to good people who try to do right? Why do those things happen? I'm just trying to do right. I'm just trying to serve the Lord. I'm just trying to obey Him. I'm just trying to live godly. And I'm trying to apply these principles in my life. And I'm sure not presenting myself uh, 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 any more than I am. I'm just a flesh, but at least I'm just trying to stay on the right path. And it just seems like uh, things after things keep coming to me, Paul says. And then in verse 10, he says, you know what? These things come so that at the end of it all, that Christ may be magnified and glorified greater in me. That's why. Paul knew what it was to be cast down. Yet he knew that he was not destroyed. He knew that he was in the care of Jesus Christ. He knew that he was in the care of the Good Shepherd. When we find ourselves cast down, Jesus stands ready to restore. David said in Psalm 23, 3, He restoreth my soul. And God takes that sheep and there you go. He sets him back up. 
And I believe that's where the local church is so crucial in people's lives. Where you can be around people who love you and care about you. And you may say, because everyone's always judgmental and negative, and you can always find that. And that's plenty. That's easy, by the way. But take the high road. And take the road less traveled. But the church is the road and the avenue where you can be around people who love you and care about you. And here's the thing. Caring about you doesn't mean that we ignore the issues that you have in your life and that they're never pointed out and that your sin is never dealt with. That's not what care means. Care means I'll love you in the good, I'll love you in the bad. That's what it means. And I care enough about you to help you. Sometimes as we go through life, we find ourselves out of joint. You ever been out of joint with someone? You ever been feeling like you're kind of defeated or even discouraged? We don't walk into church saying, hey, I'm glad to be here. I am discouraged. Woohoo! No one walks in the door saying that. Can't wait to get here because I am mad as a hornet. No one walks into church doing that. Everyone walks into church with a good attitude or supposedly, but really underneath they're probably maybe grumbling and griping. When the fact is, we are all like sheep. <laughs> and yet Christ will take His Word. He will take this book as you get in it. That's why it's so important for us to stay in this Bible. And Psalm 23 says, He restoreth my soul. He restoreth my inner man. The person that got hurt, where my feelings are, where my thoughts are that no one cares, where I thought that someone maybe jumped to a conclusion too fast, Jesus says, I'll fix that for you. Where people aren't that kind or... Maybe the preacher didn't speak to you this today. Jesus will fix that for you. And Jesus will help restore what is wrong. And he will make it right for you and I. And those wrong feelings that maybe had nothing to do with church. It could have been something that was in your family. It could be something that is in your family that's deep-rooted. It could be something that someone did to you. Uh, maybe a family member that is just unbelievable and it's ungodly. And it may be something that is maybe even prosecutable in court. I don't know. But Jesus is letting you know, listen, those things may to be dealt with on that level. And I get it, but I want you to know for you. I will restore you. I will fix that for you. I will help you. And here's the thing about it. Jesus never says, I will take care of them for you. I won't set them straight for you. I won't give them one of these for you. But I sure will work on you. <laughs> I will restore your soul. I will restore you. And that's encouraging. You know, I think of an individual when I think of people who have messed up, kind of like you and I. And I think of an individual in the Bible, and I'd like for you to go with me there, and I'd like for you to show you this guy. And that's in John chapter 21. Would you scoot there with me? John chapter 21. And I'd like for you to look at this. When you talk about people who have messed up, and people who maybe are on the other side and they've, they've caused a lot of hurt. And to really get the whole snapshot and the, the whole process and the thought of the restoring. David said, he restoreth my soul. And if you remember, that word restore literally means, it gives the idea of setting or mending a broken bone. What was broken, God puts back together. And I think of this guy because he, he kind of gets 
kind of gets the wrong end of the stick, if you will. He draws the short straw. And that's Peter. And look at John chapter 21 and look at verses 15 through 17. Do you know the story? Before the crucifixion, man, the people come up to Peter, do they not? And they're like, hey, um, um, are, you know, we arrested um, this Jesus of Nazareth. We arrested that guy. And uh, weren't you just hanging out with him? Uh-uh. Didn't I see you with him when, when he made that lame guy walk? Weren't you in that crowd? Weren't you one of those guys? No. Um, are you sure? Because I thought that, that when, when Jesus healed the blind man and the guy regained his sight, um, I thought you were there. And, and I literally thought that you participated in that. And, and, and when the questions came up about who sinned in the life, I, I thought you were part of that whole scene. Are, are you sure? Not me. The Bible declares that Peter denied ever knowing Jesus. But look at verses 15 through 17. I've taught on this just briefly because it was about the, the witnesses of the resurrection. And I find it so interesting. That the very man who stuck it to Jesus, if you will, is the first person that Jesus went to go see. And in verse 15, so when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, hey, let me ask you a question. Lovest thou me more than these? Peter, yes, he said unto him, Yea, Lord, yeah, you know. Thou knowest that I love thee. Then he said unto him, look at this, feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Well, I sure do. Verse 16. He saith to him again the second time. I'm going to repeat it. Simon, the son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest, you know that I love thee. And he said unto him, Feed my sheep. Verse 17. He said unto him the third time. Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And yet he asked him three questions. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Verse 17. Peter was grieved. I mean, his heart sunk in his chest. Because he said unto him the third time, I know where you're going with this, Jesus. I am reminded. Lovest thou me, Peter? Peter, you love me. He said in him, Lord, thou knowest all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said in him, then feed my sheep. I find this so compelling and compassionate. That the person who turned their back on their Savior, Jesus went to and restored. Let me tell you, cast down sheep. Let me tell you, one who has messed up. Jesus will come to you and he will remind you of who he is. But at the same time, he will say, you know what? I'm going to help you, and I'm going to spend time with you, and I'm okay with you. I love you, Peter. Peter, you've messed up, 
But here comes Christ after Peter sinned against Jesus. And he comes to restore Peter back to a place of useful service. And by the way, Peter was used greatly by God after this moment. The Bible says this guy got on fire and preached like you've never seen. Because at that moment, his fellowship and relationship was restored with the good shepherd. And he says, Peter, now you are ready. Now go feed my sheep. And that's exactly what Peter did. He was restored. You know what Jesus does as the good shepherd? He picks you up when you fall. Man, Peter fell. Paul fell. David fell. He restoreth my soul. You ever blew it with God? <laughs> yes, you have. Many times over. Can you count them? Can you remember? I bet you can remember the latest one. And you know what Jesus reminds us of through Scripture? I will restore you. I'm here to pick you up when you fall. I'm here to help you. Would you go to Jeremiah? I'd like for you to go to Jeremiah. So go back to... Jeremiah chapter 20, and look at this prophet. Jeremiah knew what it was like to be cast down. Look at Jeremiah chapter 20, and look at verses 8 and 9. <laughs> well, go to verse 7. Jeremiah is sent to go and prophesy and to warn the people. Be used of God to warn the people. God's judgment's coming. And verse 7 says, O Lord, <laughs> thou hast deceived me. I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I and hast prevailed. I am in, I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. They think I'm a big joke, God. I'm the laughing stock of the church. Verse 8. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil. Because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me. And a derision daily. But I lifted up my voice. I spoke for you. I did what you asked me to do. In verse 9, Then I said, I will not make mention of him. I'm so mad at you, I'm not even going to talk about you anymore. I'm so mad at the church, I'm not going back anymore. I can't believe they did that. So you know what? I'm out. For it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Sometimes the church doesn't even get three strikes. They get one attempt, and after that, I'm out. Jeremiah did it too, by the way. I'm not even going to say your name. I'm so mad what happened. These people mocked at me. These people didn't care, give a rip about you and what I had to say. So I'm not even going to mention your name. That's pretty strong words. I'm not even going to mention the name. Free. I'm not going to mention the name anymore. Then verse 9. Nor speak anymore his, in his name. Not only I'm not going to mention your name, I'm not even going to speak for you. I'm not going to say anything about you. But, verse 9, his word was in mine heart. 
as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Man, my wagon was loaded. I was fed up to here. But me and the Lord were so close, and I realized how good he was to me, and how good he's been to me, and how he wants to take care of me, that it is impossible for me to keep my mouth shut about the good shepherd. Because he is good. You couldn't keep me away from church. You can't keep me out of here. You could put bars on the windows and, and bars on the doors. Somehow, if you give a little crack in the door and the window, I'm getting in there. Why? You can't keep me away from what God is doing. That's what Jeremiah said. But I'll tell you what. You let someone... Put a wrong baby bottle in someone's diaper bag here at the church in the nursery. I'm out of here. I ain't coming back. Just be glad we fed the child, okay? I mean, get over it. I mean, we, at least we're looking after him. I mean, we get so worked up about the smallest things. We get so bent out of shape. Well, so-and-so doesn't speak to me. Well, they're probably thinking that about you because you haven't spoken to them either. So I hope now that all of you don't leave because that's how you feel and that's how they feel. Well, that's probably two people gone. I'm not even going to speak about that church. I'm not even going to speak for that church. And then Jeremiah realizes, man, how good this shepherd is. Have you ever felt like there was nobody to help you? Have you ever felt alone? Paul knew what it was like. But I want you to listen to Paul's testimony. Go to 2 Timothy. We're almost done for tonight. Go to 2 Timothy. I want you to look at chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4, Paul understood this, and look at verse 16 and 17. That's a sad start of a verse. At my first answer, no man stood with me. You ever felt alone? Paul said, I did. Paul said, man, I looked and there was no one there with me. But all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. Paul could have been justified by kind of give them the old what to for. You know what I mean? He could have just straightened them out. Maybe set them straight. But he says, no. I pray that it not be laid to their charge, notwithstanding, verse 17. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me. That by the preaching might be fully known. That by me the preaching may be fully known. And that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. I'm not going to sit here and gripe and complain, Paul says. Because I know there's a greater work to do and that God wants to use me for his glory. And at the end of it all, Jesus was there every step of the way. See, that's what the good shepherd does. Did you know that? The good shepherd is always looking after his sheep. The good shepherd always knows where his sheep are. There are many reasons why we find ourselves as cast sheep. Could be sin. Might be just absolute blatant sin on your part and my part. You might be suffering the consequences purely because you are living in sin and you refuse to repent. It might be your choosing. Could be because of bad choices. Or it could just be because of the trials of life. Could be just because 
bad things happen, and we live on a sin-cursed world. But I reminded that Christ cares for you. And although sometimes it's not our fault, the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 7, 5, 7, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares upon Him, for He careth for you. Say the good shepherd cares for us. We should be under His control. We should be under His care. Why? Because He's always there to pick you up when you fall. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Christ loves to take His cast sheep and restore them in their soul and in their heart. May I go back to and end with the sheep, the sheep that get cast down. I have not told you. And this is by way of testimony from books I have read and testimonies of shepherds who have given this of how the shepherd helps a cast sheep. When that sheep finds itself on its back and with its four legs up, maybe due to its own choosing. The shepherd stated that from afar off, that he could hear his sheep and notice that his sheep were gone, and that he could see them from afar off, and that normally, that when that happens and he sees this uh, 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 taking place, that his heart begins to beat fast. He starts to realize that time is of the essence, and he starts to breathe any faster, and he start, his heart starts to beat faster, and then he starts to pick up his steps, and he finds himself in a faster pace after his sheep realizing that it's a matter of urgency to get to where the sheep are in a matter of time because it's urgent or that sheep will die in its current condition. The testimony of the shepherd goes on to say that he doesn't get to the sheep and when he arrives unto the sheep, he doesn't stand over the sheep and go, You stupid sheep! How come you do this? Every time you're left alone, this is the condition that I find you in. Every time I tell you not to do it, what do you do? You go and do it. I turn my back on you for five seconds. And the very thing that you do is you go and walk, run off and you find yourself on your back. You are so stupid. What's wrong with you? That's not what he does. The shepherd says that he usually bends down and he finds himself bending down to where the sheep is. And while the sheep is on its back, he just starts to talk to the sheep in a tone and a voice that is calming and lets and reassuring, lets the sheep know, you're going to be okay. It's going to be all right. And that as he's talking to the sheep, he is caressing the sheep. He's touching the sheep. And as he's touching the sheep, what happens is that normally if they're left in that position, that the extremities of that sheep start to go numb and they start to lose feeling. So what he does, he starts to roll the sheep over just on its side, just a little bit, and he starts to rub the legs and massage the legs of every one of those cast sheep. Why? Because he cares for the sheep. And he nurtures that sheep. And then in just a matter of moments, he starts to go to the other legs. And as he is ministering to that sheep and just caressing that sheep and encouraging that sheep and talking to that sheep, he puts that sheep on its feet. Now often when that happens, the sheep begins to waddle and it begins to not kind of like a baby calf that has just been born or a, or, or a baby uh, a horse that has just been born. It usually cannot stand on its own very well and so its legs are not getting its feelings so it stays right there with that sheep. No, hold on, hold on. And then it takes that sheep once it has restored to its strength and its legs. Go on. You can do it. 
You're going to be okay now. Everything's all right. I got you. I'm here. The good shepherd is for you. And then you know what find what you find? You see this in often pictures, and you don't find it any other time. Did you know that sheep can jump? They bounce. And do you realize that they only bounce and jump when they're extremely happy? They get on their feet. And once they're restored to their natural position and restored, as David said, he restoreth my soul, they start to bounce and hop almost like they're not even touching the ground. They look like popcorn. Boing! Boing, boing, why? They are so happy for what the shepherd just did for them. You can always spot a sheep that has just been recently under the care of the good shepherd. Why? Because there is joy in their life. They are bouncing spiritually. And yes, they have, may have had moments of being cast down in their life. And they may have those times in their life. But they know that their shepherd is going to be right there to pick them up and caress them. You're going to be okay. Come on. You can do it. I'm right here. I haven't left you. I haven't forsaken you. I will pick you up when you fall. That is the life with the good shepherd. Don't you love your Savior a little bit more tonight because of Psalm 23? What a special psalm. And we've only gotten through half of verse 3. There's so much more to learn. I pray that you'll come back next week. And thank you for being part of the Bible study tonight. Let's go to the Lord right now and thank Him for His goodness and His care. Father, we thank You for knowing that we are under the good care as those who are in Christ, we are under the good care of the Good Shepherd and that you are there to pick us up when we fall. And sometimes that is repeatedly taking place. Sometimes it's because of our own choosing. choosing. Sometimes it's just based off of circumstances in life, bad choices or just bad things that take place. But either way, we know that you aren't there to kick us and to point out that, you know, we're stupid and that we had it coming and, and, and just kind of beat us up when we're down. That's not what you are doing. You come to our aid. You come to our rescue. You come to us as Psalm 23 says, He restoreth. My soul, you come to fix what is broken. And as broken as our lives can be and messed up as we can be, we are reminded, Jesus, how good you are. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you for the life that you have given us in Christ. And Lord, may we stay under the full control of and the full care of the Good Shepherd. We can get out of that if we choose. We don't have to listen to you. We don't have to obey you. We don't have to care about the things of God. We don't have to come to church. We don't have to be in our Bible. We don't have to pray. We don't have to do anything. But we get to come to church. We get to read your Bible. We get to pray. We get to be around other people and believers. We get to worship. We get to be under your care if we so choose. So God, I pray that on a daily and moment by moment basis, we will be reminded that there is no better care than under the care of the Good Shepherd. That's the life of the Good Shepherd, that he is for us. Thank you, God, for the words that we have read and studied tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.